we give that great children's choir a hand this morning? So amazing. We're more into grandchildren. Now you go, well, how can someone so young have grandchildren? Well, I know I look 20, and that is true, give or take, 47 years. But anyway, we do have eight grandchildren, including triplet five-year-olds. Can we, in the, I know. I'm so glad I'm their grandparent, not their father, but that's another story, okay? I get weary just watching them. Anyway, okay, can we give God a great hand too? Worthy of all our praise, all our adoration. I'm so privileged to be here at Milestone, and as was alluded, I've known Pastor Jeff and Brandy a long time. They used to come out to our house in California before they had children. That's back when he still had hair as well. Um, believe it or not, he had a mullet. When I first met Jeff, his hair was kind of down his back. And, um, but we've been friends a long time, as was Jed and Sarah, and he'd come out and we'd just barbecue together. I'd have start three grills, we'd just cook, sample and eat most of the time he was there, but very dear to me. I love being in part of this church. I'm on the board. By the way, you have an incredible board. I'm so thankful for the men from Milestone that serve on that board. They're just tremendous. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, I want to thank you whether our enemies are visible or invisible. You're greater. In fact, you say greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I'm asking now as we conclude this series uh, that you'd help us, that you'd speak to us, and you'd open our eyes and teach us, Lord. Amen. Been in a series with Pastor Jeff called Invisible Enemies. How many of you have enjoyed that series? And I was with, had dinner with Kathy and my wife. Kathy's with me, been married 43 years, and just celebrated our 43rd anniversary. Um, I, I married her at 10, just kidding. Anyway, so, and at dinner we were talking about this series, and Pastor Jeff asked me to conclude that. So I'm gonna basically, Invisible Enemies, and I'm gonna entitle the last message in this series, Recognizing and Resisting Your Invisible Enemies. Like, how do you know that you're facing an invisible enemy? How do you know that maybe what you're feeling is not just a bad day? Or it's not just a, a drop in some chemical balance or just a tough time in the world, that's easy right now. How do you begin to realize that, okay, maybe I really am under spiritual attack. Maybe this is spiritual warfare, maybe it's not all natural. I have the privilege of traveling the world, been to many, many nations, and we're walking into one country where basically every major sports team had a witch doctor. That's exactly right. And before the games, the witch doctors would have a curse off. And so basically, they'd, like, they'd take turns cursing each other's team to make sure in the invisible realm they'd won the war. That's interesting. And their leaders had been educated in Cuba. They were Marxists. And I was on the way to visit one of their leaders. Some said, now, you know, Jim, here, a lot of times leaders put lion fat on their head. I thought, lion fat in there? They go, yeah. It's called the Mindoro spirit. They want to channel the power of the lion to attack their enemy. And I thought, whoa, that's a little weird. I said, I may, I may try that anointing oil thing in the Bible. So I rubbed a little anointing oil on my head before they got the lion fat. Anyway, oil's better than fat. So much for that. Now, so it's a crazy world out there. And what we as Americans kind of wonder about, and by far the majority of the world, it's not wondered about. There are nations where at least 40% of the population wear charms to protect them from evil spirits. I remember one country, um, I was in fact to be on the Syrian border. Uh, Kathy was with me, I was going to meet with an imam. And um, he was cooking me lamb there and I, so I meet this imam and he brought a friend. He was really afraid that somehow I might overpower him spiritually so he had brought the most notable exorcist in the community to meet me. No, it's an interesting world. But how do we know there really are invisible enemies? What the Bible teaches. Ephesians 6, 12 says, you're not always wrestling with flesh and blood. Not everything you're battling against, fighting against is human. But against the rulers and the authorities and the cosmic powers over this present darkness. 
against spiritual forces in the heavenly places, in the invisible realm. When, when we look at the Bible, how the, the worldview of the Bible is there's not just a physical world. There's not just a world that we can see, hear, touch, taste, prove through the scientific method, see through a microscope, look through a telescope. The average American in the invisible world is that which you can see through a microscope. Yeah, the other organisms there, or I can look with a telescope. That's not the Bible view. There's also an invisible world where God dwells, the angels, they're, they're demon spiritual. What are demons? Well, the Bible says when Satan fell, most theologians believe that a third of the angels fell with him and that's a demonic host. Does that scare you, Jim? No, because God's a creator and they're just created. But that, that is reality, there are invisible enemies. It's what the Bible teaches. And then there is the eternal world. So the question becomes, how do you know if you're facing an invisible enemy? We look at all these wars and all these things and we peek in the Revelation and when it talks about war it said, demons came and seduced kings to war. You understand it says, the God of this world blinds people's eyes so they can't see. You say, well this is a little strange sounding. Maybe strange sounding, but it's true. It's what the Bible teaches. So I wanna start with a passage of scripture then I wanna help you very practically recognize when maybe you're facing one of these invisible enemies, and if you are, what do you do? Now we'll look at Mark 4, 35 through 41 for a moment, and Jesus has just been in really one of the first great revivals of his ministry. He's coming to Capernaum, and I've been there, it's a fascinating town on, on Lake of Galilee. He's met a Roman centurion whose servant has been healed supernaturally. He gets to Peter's house. This is interesting. She has a fever, she's very sick, and the Bible says he rebukes the fever. That, I might add, is the word that comes out of Jewish exorcism. Jesus realized there's something here that's not just a fever. Then it says all kinds of sick people, it goes on to say, and people tormented by demons, invisible enemies, came to the house and every one of them was set free. The crowd began to grow, so much so that Jesus got in a fishing boat, pulled offshore, was speaking, and all of a sudden it was getting dark, Jesus says, by the way, we're leaving here, that's counterintuitive, you've got a crowd, and we're sailing across the Sea of Galilee. This scares them because the other side of the Sea of Galilee is the Decapolis, 10 cities Romanized by the general Pompey almost 100 years ago after he had basically captured Jerusalem and defiled the holy place. So they're now on the way. This is the first foray of Jesus into the Gentile world. And as they're going across, here's what the Bible says. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let's go across to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took with them they took him with them in the boat. In other words, they just basically got him out of the boat and sailed. Other boats were with them, the little flotilla. And a great windstorm arose. I might add a mini hurricane. On the Sea of Galilee to this day, because of it's kind of below sea level and the way the, the mountains and stuff were around it, they have storms which in the Arabic they call shark winds. Deadly storms can come out of nowhere, creating little mini hurricanes. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. Out of nowhere came a storm so powerful, the boat was beginning to sink. Now you're gonna find that the disciples are on that boat, 12 of them, minimally four of them had grown up as fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They're scared to death, they're gonna wake up and say, we're dead, we're dying. Why, they realize this is a storm our granddad said, you get this storm, you're dead, you won't come home. If you're ever here, you're done. You ever been in a situation where you realize, I'm just done? Have you ever laid dying? I have. They read the doctors tell you, quit work, you've destroyed your health with an autoimmune disease, I have. You ever heard the word that there's nothing we can do for your child, they're dying. You get to those points in life, 
You ever held a dying child in your arms who you'd watched go out to play college football? Now he's 107 pounds and his skin is peeling off. You come to a situation where you just like need God to intervene. And of course, where is Jesus sound asleep? You ever feel like maybe God's kind of sleeping in your crisis? If God's sleeping in is your crisis, many times it's because you already have the answer. It's in your heart. He taught you. They wake him up and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? They'd given in. And he awoke, and this is stunning. The wind is howling. The boat is sinking. And the Bible said he rebuked the wind. That's the same word when it says he rebuked Peter's mother-in-law's fever. The word rebuke is used two times in the book of Mark before we get here to rebuke a demon. It's from the language of Hebrew exorcism. Jesus is now addressing the wind as if it was an entity. Now you understand in the days of Jesus, you can't read the New Testament and not realize that he cast out demonic entities. He, it may be weird to you, but it's, it's normal in the Bible. And in the ancient world, exorcism was not unknown. Every religion had their exorcists. Hebrews had their exorcists. Jesus told the Pharisees, your sons are casting out the devil. But they would like call on God, call on Raphael the angel, shake bells, burn incense. They were, and Jesus would say, get out. He was the only exorcist they ever seen that didn't call on a God while he was God. And now he's rebuking wind. Tell me, that's crazy. Like, you know, if a tornado's coming towards your house, of course you get desperate enough for the tornado. I've been chased by those things. Who knows what you might call on? He stands up, wind, I rebuke you. Then he goes on to say to the waves, he, he, peace be still. To the waves, it basically is saying in the original language, shut your mouth. Okay, like, you gotta be kidding me. In fact, when you look at the grammatical construction, it's like he's speaking to a person or an entity. What does Jesus realize? Okay, wind, stop. Waves, shut your mouth. And it works. They're stunned. They're even more afraid of him than they were the storm. What Jesus realized is we're going to the Gentile world for the first time. We're going into this broken place of idolatry and demonization and invisible enemies have resisted us. And behind this storm, is not just a weather pattern. There's something else here. All of your commentators realize this. Even when they can't put their finger on it, some just say it out loud, others say, there's something different here. Like, this wasn't just nature. But Jesus realized, well, how did he realize? That brings me then to the point, how do you recognize your invisible enemies? And let me basically break this down in two ways. I wanna talk about deduction based on your sensory perceptions and questions. And then I wanna talk about how do you build on the foundation of deduction and go to discernment? How does the Holy Spirit help you realize that maybe this thing is spiritual? You know, I pastored for many years and Kathy and I had moved to an area, we called it the land that time forgot. Uh, in, deep in the south part of North, North Carolina and we were raising up a church there and it was kind of a sign and wonder in that, in, in that era and day and one night I heard my two-year-old screaming. I might add that wasn't always unusual and um, I think we just had our second child my wife said, I'm too tired, please go up. So I'm marching up the stairs and when I walked in the room you ever walk in a room and feel something evil? Raise your hand. There was evil in his room. And I realized immediately, this is more than colic. This is more than just the stomach. So how do you stop there and say, this is spiritual, and if it is, what do I do? I start by asking myself two questions. My first question is, 
Has there been any change in my level of kingdom advancement? Because when you commit to advancing the kingdom, you're going to be resisted by the enemy. When you became a small group leader, they may have forgotten to tell you that. When you decide, I'm gonna go in small groups, and all of a sudden the day of small group became your worst day every week. What is the connection between my worst day and small group? Could it be maybe there's an invisible enemy that doesn't want you there? So I've been asked a question, concurrent with what I've been experiencing, did I make a decision that was gonna advance the kingdom of God more? Did I choose to serve? Did I choose to lead? My second question is, has there been more spiritual growth in my life? Have I spent more time with God, prayed more, bonding with my spouse more, teaching my kids the ways of God? Because the enemy, the only thing he fears more than you, finding Christ as Savior or Lord, is drawing close to him and receiving the power of his spirit and getting in that Bible. He fears that. You begin to realize, why was it? I was told by Pastor Jeff, if I just read my Bible more, I'd feel better. That's not been fully true. In fact, I've been reading my Bible and all of a sudden this strange depression is whirling around my head. In fact, we were told if we just go to the milestone marriage weekend, things would be better. Well, things got worse for us before we got better. Like, why is that? Could this be spiritual? So I begin to ask these questions It has this thing I'm feeling, something happening, is it concurrent with another step of service? Is it concurrent with another step of growth? And then I examine four things. The intensity of what I'm experiencing, the density of what I'm experiencing, the immensity or how it's growing, and lastly, do I already have a propensity for it? You ever been in a situation where you say, We ain't fought this much in years, pardon my grammar. Like, we've never had the kids sick this long and why aren't these antibiotics working anymore? Or, has my child just gone crazy? Like, our finances were never better, the company was growing, now the bottom has fallen off. Like, you feel like this is just not normal. When you begin to use words like that, well, this is not natural, well, maybe it's not all natural. Maybe there's something supernatural about it. Maybe the enemy's resisting. Then I begin to look at density. You ever just feel stuck and don't know why? You ever feel like I'm hitting a wall, but I can't figure it out? Like, I was making such amazing progress, and now I'm barely moving. You feel like you can't see it, but you're pushing against something. You just feel like this this weighty kind of heavy thing. You can feel it, but not articulate it. Then immensity, and the fact of it is when you get in real spiritual warfare long enough, it minimizes your master, Jesus, and it magnifies the monster you're facing. Problem just bigger and bigger. Depression becomes bigger than Jesus. Anxiety, fear. You go, I used to be a worry war, but all of a sudden now, my skin's changing. You get so anxious, your skin feels like it's crawling. When you were a child, you'd, you'd have a real stage fright and you've been speaking, but all of a sudden, your throat is tightening up in public now. Is it all natural? What's happened? One of you said today, Pastor Jim, I had years free from migraines. They've come back and they're piercing my temple. I mean, and I'm doing nothing different. I haven't changed my diet. Enemy is very subtle. He likes to attack you in an area of your propensity. That propensity to melancholy. Ah, that's just my norm. I'm just a little more depressed than usual. Well, I'm kind of type A. I'm just kind of, no wonder I'm not getting along with my spouse or I'm just more angry. Ah, you know, it's always been hard. Listen, he loves to subtly attack you in an area where you have a propensity toward that weakness because it takes you a while to catch it. But as much as deduction is helpful, as much as asking questions is helpful, how do you transition from deduction based on sensory perception 
to discernment, which is based on spiritual perception. In 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It talks about miracle prophecies, faith. Romans 12 talks about a gift of mercy, all these different gifts. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, it describes the gift of the Spirit this way. The ability to distinguish between spirits. Like, what does that mean? That means there is a spiritual gift that enables you to recognize what is happening in the invisible world around you. In the invisible world around us, yes, there are the demonic and Satan, but there's also the work of the Holy Spirit and angels. You know, the Bible says angels work in our life, we're not aware of it, did you know that? In fact, Paul made a crazy statement, Better be hospita- you better be hospitable, you might be entertaining an angel. You say, that's weird, no, that's the Bible. One of the greatest missionaries in Japan, honestly, a man that started amazing churches, I grew up around him, and his wife had gotten saved in pre-World War II Japan, that was no easy matter. She was 12 years old, and she was swimming in a river, and a current got her, and she's being carried out to sea. N- n- family, brothers couldn't rescue her. And the little girl, she remembers, I looked up and this man in a gleaming white robe jumped into the water, snatched me, saved me, and disappeared. You tell me. She turned to Christ and her brothers would pin her against the wall and pour hot tea down her nose to make her deny Christ. But when you've been rescued by an angel, it's pretty hard to deny Very rarely does the invisible world step out. But through the gift of discernment, we look in. Now, even if you don't have the gift of discernment, and some of you do, but not all of us, you do have the Holy Spirit who is able to help you discern what's affecting you in a world you can't see with the eye. How does this work? In the book of Job, we find out that Job says, God speaks to a man or woman one way, then another, but they don't always perceive it. That means God can be trying to communicate with you, you just don't get it. Now, let me give you four very practical ways the Holy Spirit communicates with you. And then I'll go from there to giving you how do you respond. The primary way God communicates with us is the Bible. All scripture, God breathed, trains, teaches, reproves. But there are times, I, of course I read my Bible every day. I grew up, it was kind of like, in, my parents never read Dr. Spock, my dad. They thought the only two things you need to raise a child, the board and the Bible. They believed my rear end was connected to my brain and the more they hit it, the smarter I got. And so, I told Jed and Sarah, if they caught me saying a dirty word, there's a threefold cord of of parenting. Number one, they'd whip me. Number two, I'd gargle with ivory soap. Number three, I'd read on on, uh, James on the tongue. My parents were just old school. They never read Dr. Spock, reason with your monstrous toddler. But anyway, so much for that. Now, my dad, before he died, goes, I may have spanked you once or twice so much, son. I said, Daddy, you probably missed about 100 times. That's another story. But I didn't want to tell you until you were dying. Okay, now. So so we're here in this situation. But what I find in my own life, because I have a life of reading the Bible, there are times when all of a sudden a scripture will seemingly come from nowhere and just right there in my mind. Uh, Some months ago, I just felt condemned. You ever feel that way? Like ashamed, uh, losing my, I couldn't figure it out. I mean, I wasn't doing anything different than usual, but I had this just slimy feeling of condemnation. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit quickened a verse, an obscure verse out of Zechariah to me, where it says, when Joshua the high priest was standing before the throne of God, Satan was at his right hand accusing him. And the Lord didn't say, the Lord rebuke you, Joshua. He said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. That verse came and God, I realize it, son. One of your unseen enemies is lying to you. He's condemning you, and I'm not rebuking you. I'm rebuking him. And the minute I rebuke that thing, everything turned. Now, there's also what I call visceral recognition. 
visceral describes certain deep emotions in the human soul. Deep feelings that are hard to ignore. At times hard to control. All of you have walked in a room and felt danger. There's no one here that hasn't had some response to something and you just feel evil. Perhaps before you were even a Christian, you just knew something's dark here, I don't know what it is. Children very sensitive to things, they'll go, something's in my room. No, you're not, go to sleep, you're crazy. So we expect our kids to believe in an invisible world and raise them like there's not one. My kids say, Daddy, there's something, I'm coming right up. It's under my bed, let me peek right now. Why would I do that? Because how do I know what's in their room? And I might add, if anything is in their room, they have authority in Christ. You know, I, I can remember raising kids. They'd come down at night, I'm too afraid to sleep in my room. Let me get in bed with you. Well, that's not a thought I liked much. But I would be a spiritual parent and say, no, no, no. Let me get in bed with you. Now, humor aside, why did I do that? Because I want to teach them young. Nothing can drive you out of your room. I want to teach them young that there's no fear you can't deal with in Christ. I also didn't want them in my bed, but that's another story. Okay, now. So that we get these feelings, we get these senses, like I stood in my hotel room the other night, I may have started by saying that, and I just felt evil in my hotel room. I said, honey, something's troubling me tonight. There's something off here. I went to bed and my dreams were shattered with torment for three hours. I finally got back out of bed. I said, I should have listened to that feeling. Lord, what is this? You see, the Lord doesn't just elementary give us these visceral feelings. He'll also communicate with us visually. The Bible calls it visions. Well, that's kind of a weird mystical world. No, that means typically God uses the screen of your imagination to show you something. You say, you're kidding me. No, I'm not. The Bible talks about visions and dreams all the time. It's when God uses that to show you what you could not see otherwise. You know, I really believe in prayer and one of my spiritual sons was, was leading a group of men at a very dangerous fire base in Afghanistan. Pastor Jed would know him and Sarah, I homeschooled this kid. It's a tough military unit and he came to me and said, Uncle Jim, he said, I'm, I'm going to Afghanistan Will you promise to pray for me? I said, yes, I will. I'd ra help raise him from a little boy. Prayer time one morning and I just feel this visceral feeling of danger around this young soldier. I began to pray. I had a vision on the screen of my imagination. I saw him on patrol at night getting ready to step on an IED. You say, that's crazy. Well, it was crazy until he got home. Pastor, Pastor Jim, Uncle Jim, one night I was on patrol, getting ready to step and something froze me and stopped me and I looked down, there was an IED. You see, the Holy Spirit shows us things. He doesn't just show us things, there's not just visual recognition, there's vocal recognition. You can't read the Bible and not believe God talks to people. What are all those voices in your head? Well, some of them are me, but some of them may be God. I love the story there in 1 Kings 19, 12 through 13. Elijah's had a fairly bad day. Jezebel's trying to kill him. He's up on the most wanted. He gets in a cave. There's a fire, doesn't budge. There's an earthquake, a wind. Then he hears a whisper. You see, God will speak to you in your conscious mind. You go, that can't be true. Oh, yes, it is. You know, Kathy and I, when we were, when we were dating slash courting, it's called different things in different eras, but it was a number of years ago we'd been married. We just had our 43rd anniversary. And we made a commitment. We, whenever we were together at night, and I wasn't traveling or she wasn't traveling, we'd pray together and read the Bible. We've kept that. And we're praying one night, and we're, we, we pray for all our children, all our grandchildren, etc. And we got to Abraham, one of the triplets. And I felt dread. I saw, I said, something's wrong with Abraham, honey. This is about, about three years ago. Something's wrong. And I said, Lord, what is it? He said, there's a spirit of death coming to kill him. You say, that's weird. Oh, it was true. We begin to pray. We begin to cry out. We, we know we have authority. Jesus, right now, we rebuke death. The next day, they found him in the corner, curled up, blue, dying. Snatched him into the car, racing in the hospital while our daughter-in-law did CPR and Peter drove. 
God saved him. See, the Holy Spirit will help you. I appreciate praying after someone's already in the hospital. I'd like to kind of pray before they get there from time to time. Don't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit. That night when I stood and I saw evil, the Lord opened my eyes in a moment, allow me to see what was oppressing that little two-year-old, and I rebuked it, and he was fine. Now, when you begin to recognize that maybe there's some unseen enemy in your life, or over your grandchild, your child, your spouse, our country, we look at all these terrible wars and all the things happened in Ukraine. I've been all through Russia, all through the Baltic states, in Ukraine, all of it. It's not just political. It's not just, you know, the insane dreams of some, you know, maniac leader. Oh, it's far deeper than that. You look at the book of Revelation, you said that demon spirits went out and enticed the kings to go to war. There are spiritual realities beyond the breakdown in America. All the polarization and pain in our country, it's not all political. It's not all generational. It's not all ethnic. It's spiritual as well. So what do you do when you wake up to the fact that, okay, this isn't all natural? I'll say two things to you and I'll leave you with these. You must never forget the power of the word of God and the spirit of God. In, in Ephesians 6, Paul, who's chained between two praetorian guards waiting to see Nero for two years, begins to realize that in the Roman army, there's a metaphor of spiritual warfare. And he finally gets to the second to the last piece of the armor, which is the sword of the spirit. And he says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. What is he saying? The Bible is a sword. That word of God is a spiritual sword in your hand. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, you remember that? He's really hungry, the devil appeared. If you're hungry, turn this bread into stones. That never would have gotten me. The devil would have said, if you're hungry, turn that bread into brisket, I might have succumbed, that's another story. But Jesus answered, not out of his own emotions, but no, the Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from God's mouth. Now the word for word here is an interesting word, it's rhema, that's kind of the word expressed, explained. That means when the enemy attacks you and you speak the word of God, you exclaim the word of God, it's like a sword that cuts through your invisible enemies. Oh, make no mistake about it. That word of God is powerful. You'll not win the battle in your mind, you'll win it with your mouth. And you answer the enemy with scripture and the Holy Spirit inspires that scripture. It cuts through him. My wife Kathy had epilepsy for many years, botched cancer treatment. We had the best doctors, Harvard trained geniuses. There's nothing we can do for her, Jim. When your doctor tells you that, it's bad. When your Christian doctor tells you that, it's even terrible. It's like God and your doctor agree. One night we were in prayer. We're reading out of, we're out of the Bible where it says, a little boy had epilepsy. And Jesus bound the deaf and dumb spirit. He was healed. She said, let's try that. When I have a seizure, I can't hear her talk. I laid hands on her. We said, you wicked deaf and dumb spirit. She's not had epilepsy since. You see, there's a God. His word is powerful. Lastly, it's the spirit as we close. Then Paul says, pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. What's it mean to pray in the spirit? Well, one, it means praying under the inspiration of the spirit too, as Pastor Jeff has told you, there are times when the Holy Spirit gives his, his kids a prayer language. That means you're praying in a language you've never learned or heard. You say, that's crazy, no, that's in the Bible. Paul said, I speak in my prayer language more than all of you. Why is that important? Because when you don't know how to pray, according to Romans 8, the Lord prays for you in ways you don't have words for, and it connects you with God. When I stood in the darkness of that hotel room, and only God knows what happens in hotel rooms before you get there. I softly prayed in a language I'd never learned. Why? I wanted to be connected with God to know how to pray, how to battle. 
Beloved, listen to me. You are the only people, Christians like you around the world, with the power to deal with the real enemies of the world. The real enemies of the world are far deeper than ideology, far deeper than philosophy, far deeper than political. Lying, invisible enemies fracture our world, fracture our country. Whisper into the ears of people that do derange things that are just unspeakable. No matter your political persuasion, don't think whoever's in the White House has the power against invisible enemies, they don't. It's 